Welcome everyone to today's first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. I'm so excited to be here and I welcome all of you that are online. Welcome all of you that are watching live on Facebook. And welcome of course my family here in the home. Uh, I'm so excited about this. This is our 10th uh, day, a Feast of Tabernacle service that we've been celebrating. And I hope this is the best. <laughs> every year gets better and better or more interesting every single year. And so I'm just so excited to be here today. And today uh, we're going to have a powerful lesson that the Lord has put on my heart. Um, at about 4.30 in the morning, he put it on my heart. And uh, I started to prepare the lesson. I couldn't even contain myself to go to sleep last night so I could bring this message to you. Um, for all of you that are new to our ministry, uh, that are watching online um, that are, or on Facebook, our website is savedbytruth.com. You can go there and, and learn about us, our ministry there. Uh, my wife is my wife, Jamie. My son, Jaden. Uh, my, my son, my son Jaden. My son, um, Maddox. And my daughter, Jaden. And um, my uh, dog, Wellington. Uh, we, our family, we've been honoring the, the feast days, like I said, for 10 years. Uh, we've been discipled for well over 20 years. Um, and uh, I was baptized October 17, 1999, and my wife even before that. And so it's been an amazing um, 10, 20 years of my life uh, and how life has changed. But first of all, I just want to share, this is our ministry. You can go there and learn all about our ministry. You can go there and uh, see people um, from our ministry all around the world. Uh, before we get started, I just want to tell you that Save Our Truth Ministry, you may see us a few online here. You may see us a few on Facebook. But if you go on our Facebook page, uh, there's thousands upon thousands of people today now honoring the Feast of Tabernacles mm -hmm. and all the other feast days. Um, our ministry started, like I said, about 10 years ago. The Lord called us to start honoring the Sabbath day. He started teaching us about the Mark of the Beast. He started teaching us about his feast days and the meaning of them. And we didn't understand what that meant 10 years ago, but the Lord said, you need to go learn this information. So we dove in, head, for, head in, uh, you know, full on in. We pushed all of our chips in and said, we're all in. And we left the congregation we were in and to, to come and started worshiping from home. And then we went around um, to different congregations to try to understand this message about the, the Holy Feast Days. And the Lord started sharing with us over the years. And it was pretty awesome how, how God led us to different congregations to learn about the feast and, and different things that happened over the years. But it was so encouraging because um, after 10 years of learning this information, the Lord has shown us the meaning of these feast days and how powerful they are. But it started with just our family. We didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know how to, to honor the feast days. We had never heard of a feast day. We didn't even know there were feast days. We were honoring different holidays like um, Christmas and Easter and Valentine's Day and Halloween, just like everyone else was. Uh, we didn't know any difference. My daughter, as a matter of fact, her birthday was born. On, she was born December 25th. So we were. That, that was a great day for us at that time. The Lord showed me the importance of of honoring his feast days through my daughter um, on December 25th because we started focusing on the Lord. But then he started showing us how that day was actually a pagan day. In Jeremiah 10, you can read it for yourself, verse 1 through 4, it says, Do not cut down a tree and fasten it to wood and adorn it with gold and silver um, because those are the ways of the nations. He says, don't do that. It's an abomination to the Lord. So we stopped honoring Christmas on that day, but then we started learning about the Feast of Tabernacles and we learned that Tabernacles is like an eight-day Christmas. He gives us eight days to, and a whole year to save up money, to go on vacation, to spend on whatever we want. And that's what we did for every, every year. Since then, we've been buying our kids gifts. We've been going on vacation. We've been meeting with people all around the world. We found out that this feast site's just like this, all around the world happening today, all around the world, that we didn't even know about. I had never heard of anything like that, but... The Lord showed us that, Stephen, you aren't the only one honoring the feast days. <laughs> There's millions of you out there honoring the feast days that know the Bible far more than you do. So I was like, hey man, so I had to humble myself and, and come down to their feet and learn from a lot of people that were honoring the Lord and, and reading the entire Bible far more than I was at that time. And so the Lord just blessed us and, and showed us the meaning of it. So it started with our family. And then um, we had, there was a gentleman named George, he's probably on here right now. George came to our house. He was a business client of mine. And we started studying the scriptures. He got baptized in the water for the forgiveness of his sins. And then he became part of the St. Martin ministry. And, and we started studying. And then, then another person named Gustavo came. And then other people started coming to the ministry. Uh, and, and it started to grow a little bit. So we had a little house congregation, about four or five of us in the house. And then, uh, I didn't know how to do these videos and stuff, so we weren't doing that really that much at that time. But then it started to grow a little bit more, so we had about eight or ten of us at, at, at one point. But then God said, Stephen, it's time to now teach the message worldwide. 
Um, he humbled me because I was scared to do it. So in 2016, uh, God helped me um, overcome my fear, kind of the same way he did with uh, Jonah. You know how Jonah was afraid to go to Nineveh and teach, right? So what did God do? He put him in the belly of the fish and let him think about it for three days so he could overcome his fear. <laughs> That's kind of what God did for me. 2016, I went to the hospital and uh, I almost died. Literally, the doctor came in and told me, Stephen, you're going to die. Uh, I don't think you're going to make it because your lungs are collapsing, your kidneys are collapsing, and you probably are not going to make it if you don't do something about it. So I got my camera out, and I did a Facebook fa uh, selfie, and I said, God, if you let me through this, I will go preach this message. I promise you, I went live on Facebook. I told the world I will go teach this message that day. And I had friends come to visit me. Matter of fact, Eric came to visit me at that hospital that day, and several other brothers came to visit me that day. But I, preached, so I said, God, I will teach this message powerfully and will not be afraid to do it. And I came out of that hospital. The next day, the doctor came to me, and uh, after he took my x-rays and everything, the next morning, he came to me and said, Stephen, I don't know what happened, but your lungs are back to normal, your kidneys are back to normal, you can go. And I left out of that room that day in December of 2016, and I started preaching the word on video. And we started doing these messages just like this. So that little group of eight or nine people, um, we started teaching it on Facebook. And a brother named Praveen from India came and said, hey, I, I see your message. I see about the Sabbath. I don't understand how that works. So I started showing it to him. And he started taking the message. He started learning. He started teaching it. He was like, wow, this is amazing. Absolutely. And he started teaching it to his pastors. He had about nine or ten pastors. And they started understanding it. And then they went town to town, door to door, preaching the message. And in India, they, we found two other pastors in India that did the same thing. And it spread to hundreds. And they go, Stephen, when it came to the Feast of Trumpets that year, they said, Stephen, I want to teach this message. And this was in 2017. They said, I want to teach this message to some of our pastors. Can, if we get some of them together, will you fund it for us? I was like, well, I don't have much money, but I'll send you what I got. So we sent them what we had, and God blessed it. He took a couple pennies, a couple fish, and a couple pieces of bread and turned it into, into thousands. So over a thousand pastors in India learned about the feast days and the Sabbath day and the holy days for the first time. And they went out and they were so fired up. Each one of those pastors had their own congregation. And it spread like wildfire. As a matter of fact, if you go to our website on Saved by Truth, you can actually see the actual message. You can see me teaching just like I'm doing right here to those pastors in Indian Africa. We fed them and they went and spread that message all around India. To the point where this year, they had over 2,500 pastors per pastor teaching the pastors in Indian Africa. I mean, in India. It went berserk. But at that same time, in Africa, the same thing was happening. In Kenya, some brothers from Kenya saw the same message, and they said, well, I want to see it. And so they started watching the videos that we taught. I wasn't teaching a one-on-one -on -one like this. I just gave them a video. They watched the video, they read the scriptures, and they said amen. They repented, pulled their entire congregations off Sunday keeping, started keeping the true Sabbath day, which you'll learn about today. And then they started honoring the feast day, and God exploded their ministry. And people went from two people in their ministry to 50 people in their ministry, and it just started growing and growing and growing to where now in India and Africa, in, in, in multiple countries in Africa, thousands upon thousands are now honoring the feast days today for the first time, and some for the second and third time. Amen. It was amazing what God did. Amen. And it had no power to us, but we didn't have any money. All we did was show the message and show the truth on the scriptures. Because the Bible says the truth will set you free. So we started sharing that message then. It was awesome because for the next year, 2018, we did it again. In 2019, we did it again. But this year was something special. At the beginning of um, uh, the feast days, which was the Passover, we started sharing the message and we recorded it and we uh, spent a little money to broadcast it on Facebook. And that message on Facebook went far, it went far and wide. About 40, 50,000 people around the world in 40 different countries started honoring the message. And they started seeing it and they started loving it. You can go on our Facebook page and you can see what actually happened. And you can see the explosion of all the people that started finding this message all around the world. Because they started getting this coronavirus and people started getting scared. And like, what the heck is going on? And so when we showed them the truth, they went back to the scriptures and they saw the truth and they were fired up about it. And then uh, we, we taught a message in, 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 in Passover and then we taught about the man of sin and how he was revealed. And so we know that that's the end times. That's the book of Revelation in, ver in chapter 13. So the man of sin was revealed. So we knew that we were at the end times. So then Pentecost came. And you know Peter preached at Pentecost. Peter preached at um, Acts 2, verse 36 through 48, which is the foundation of our ministry. And Peter preached a powerful message about repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sin, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So God put it on my heart to teach that message. And that's what we did. So we had a group of people here, and people online started watching it. And we recorded that message. 
And we spent thousands of dollars to get that message out on Facebook. And God took it, took that little, and spread it. Over 1.7 million people watched that video so far. And that video went all around the world. And people all around the world started contacting me and saying, man, thank you so much for this message. And people started repenting all over the world. And it's been unbelievable what God has done since then. And that was just a few short months ago. Uh, and so we believe that the message today, God is going to do the same thing. There's going to be people all around the world that's going to see this message. And they're going to be inspired to start honoring the feast days again. Um, just like it was back in the days of Joshua. Um, we talked about that yesterday in the service on the Sabbath yesterday. That Joshua, in Joshua 8, you can read about it for yourself. Joshua 8 went and conquered AI. Which today is AI, the same technology AI, but he conquered a town called AI, which were the Canaanites, the fallen angels. And he went and conquered that town, and, but they, the, after they conquered the town, guess what they did? They brought back the covenant. They brought back the commandments. And they were joy, rejoicing because they did. And I believe that a lot of brothers and sisters around the world today are going to rejoice because the covenant is being brought back to them as well. So what we're going to do now is jump right into the scriptures so you can see um, how this works. But before we get started, I always like to show how the Sabbath actually works because a lot of people aren't aware of how it actually works. So I'm going to show you um, a little uh, PowerPoint real quick. Let me move my thing here out of the way. If I can pull it up, if I can get it, where'd it go? All right, so let me just show you this real fast, how the Sabbath actually works. Because um, a lot of people think that a Sabbath, a Sabbath, the Sabbath is actually on Friday night to Saturday night. Um, that's not actually true because biblically in the scriptures, there's no word for Saturday in the Bible. There's no word for Sunday in the Bible. So in Genesis 1, God made a new moon and he made a new sun in Genesis 1. And he separated the day from the night. He called the day day and he called the night night. So this time during the day when the sun comes up is the day. When the sun goes down ends the day. When the sun um, comes up and the night, the moon comes up, it's the night. When the moon goes down and the sun comes back up, it's, it's, the, it's the day. So he separated the day and the night. So a, a, a Sabbath day is during the day. Because that's when they worked. They went out in the field and they worked the day. So it's very important to understand this. So here's how the Sabbath actually works. Today is Saturday, October 3rd. Um, this is the first day of the Feast of the Tabernacle. It's the 15th day of the seventh month. You're going to see that in Scripture. Now, how do we get to the 15th day? That doesn't make sense. Today is actually October 3rd. So how is it the 15th day of the seventh month? It can't possibly be by the Gregorian calendar. That doesn't make sense to anybody, even the people that call themselves Jews. It can't be the How do you get the 15th day of the seventh month and, and everybody around the world, including the people that call themselves Jews and over there in the land called Israel, are celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles today. But how are they doing it on the 15th day of the seventh month if today is October 3rd? Well, because it's really not October 3rd biblically. Because in the Bible, there is no such thing as a Pope Gregorian calendar. There's no such thing. So let's look and see how you actually get to the seventh day, biblically. By the way, there's our YouTube channel. You can go to youtube.com forward slash saved by truth. And you can go and learn how to make it to the kingdom of heaven straight from the Bible. And there's a lot of Bible studies on there that you can go and research for yourself. But let's see how you keep the seventh day holy. Well, let's look back. Remember, back in the day, there was no Gregorian calendar, so in the first day, God made what's called a new moon. And you can read about the new moon right here in the scriptures in 1 Samuel 20, verse 24 through 27, and through Isaiah 66 and 23. You can read about the new moon, just like he made a new sun on the first day. So, the first day is called the new moon celebration. See, back then, the only way they could de determine when the month started or when the year started was by the moon. They didn't have any calendars. They had no watches. They had no cell phones. They had no nothing. So when Jesus walked the earth, they didn't have a calendar. You know, they had the sun, moon, and stars, which is God's calendar. In Genesis 1, verse 14, he says he made the sun, moon, and stars for signs, seasons, days, and years. Read about that for yourself in Genesis 1 verse 14. So if I gave you a document today that said it has the signs, the seasons, the days and years on it, what would you think it is? It's a calendar. That's God's calendar. And from the time from the beginning of the Bible till now, it's never changed. God's calendar never changed. So he made a new moon, and then guess how they got to the seventh day? They counted. If you look in the Bible, all they do is talk about the seventh day, the twelfth day, the fifteenth day of the month, the twenty-seventh day of the month, the first day of the month. Never say Tuesday. 
It doesn't say that in the scriptures. There's no such thing. That's man-made. So let's see how you get to the seventh day. You spot the new moon, and you count the seven. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. On the seventh day, it's a half a moon. Last, last Friday night, it was, it was a half a moon. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Go look outside tonight. I guarantee you $100 that it's going to be a full moon. Because it's going to be a full moon. Because it's always a full moon. It was a full moon last night. Last night was the Sabbath. The full moon is a little bit over because now it is the 15th day of the month. So it's going to be a little bit more than full moon. Okay? And then it goes 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20 first, and Then it's a half a moon on the other side. And then 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. 27 and 28 goes back to a sliver 29 days and then it's 29 days God made the Sabbath and made the, the cycle of the moon 29 and a half days so that we can um, always go and look up to him and it's been awesome so a lot of you that are watching online on Facebook or anywhere around the world you need to understand how God's true Sabbath day works so let's keep going so then it's the first 7 14 21 and 28 and so we're talking today about the Feast of Tabernacles so that's how we're going to get to the 15th day of the first month. You're going to see that in Scripture. So let's look at the annual feast days. You want to look at Leviticus 23, verse 1 through 44. That's the Scripture that talks about all the feast days and the meaning. When I first came into this message um, 10 years ago, we didn't really understand the meaning of it. We didn't understand what they were for or how they worked. And so God had to start showing us what they mean. And here's, here they are in a nutshell. Passover was the day Jesus died. He died as Passover, and that's why they were celebrating it every year, because it was kind of like a foreshadow, kind of like a wedding rehearsal. You know, we, you know, whoever gets married, you have a rehearsal before, so you can pretend and practice before the real thing happens. Well, that's what all these feast days are. They're practices. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in Colossians 2, 16, he said they are a foreshadow of things to come. In other words, Passover was a foreshadow of when Jesus actually came and did it in the flesh. So they were honoring it every year by putting blood over the doorframe, and they would honor Passover. And then Jesus came and became that Passover lamb in his body. That's the first feast. And that one was fulfilled by Jesus. The next one was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. See, when they had to leave Egypt, they had to leave in a haste because they could not let the bread rise. So because they couldn't let the bread rise, that's why it was called Unleavened Bread because the Egyptians were going to go and chase after them, and that's why God washed them away in the Red Sea. When they crossed through, by the way, that was their baptism. They walked through, all walked through the Red Sea as a, as, a, as a group, and they washed away the sin of the Egyptians. And so that was unleavened bread, and that feast was fulfilled by Jesus. The next feast was the Feast of First Fruit, and well, it was when Jesus was raised from the dead. But in the Old Testament, that's when they had to bring the first fruit of their harvest to the Lord. And that was the reason they were going out in the first place, to go bring the first fruit. And so Jesus rose on the third day, which was the 17th day of the month. Write that, that, that date down, 17th day of the first fruit. Jesus was the first fruit, and he rose on the first feast days of the year on the 17th day of the month. Actually, he rose on the 16th day, but it was right before the 17th day. Very important. Okay, so that's, that feast was fulfilled. And then the Feast of Weeks. Was um, the Feast of Weeks was 40 days later when Moses went up to the mountain, got the Ten Commandments, brought it down, and he brought that Ten Commandments down on stone. And then, of course, that was a marriage covenant between the Israelites. The Israelites had a big party down at the bottom, and he broke the Ten Commandments. And here's the cool part. God, the Lord, which is Jesus, it was the Lord, he actually broke the Ten Commandments because they were having a big party down there. Remember they built the golden calf at the bottom of the hill? And they were having a big party? So he killed, guess how many people? 3,000 people. And then guess what in the New Testament Jesus did? When Peter preached that message, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit is for you, your children, and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord God will call. See, the ones that, that accepted that message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So 3,000 were killed the first time. 3,000 were added to the body of Christ. 2,000 years later. In other words, it was fulfilled, just like he said in Colossians 2.16. It was a shadow of what was coming. So Jesus fulfilled all four feast days with his body. That was the first feast days. But then Jesus came and they killed all the Israelites and they, they killed a lot of the disciples. And what ended up happening, the word went void for a long time. 
For like 2,000 years, a lot of people weren't teaching that message because there was no disciples to teach it. That's when the Vatican came in and the people that called themselves Jews came in and all these different religions came in and the 47,000 different denominations of Christianity came in and started distorting the message and changing the doctrine and started teaching another Jesus. One that came up with a Gregorian calendar, a Friday to Saturday night service, Sabbath, a Sunday service, church service, a Saturday night service and weekend service. It was all kinds of crazy stuff. And you can honor Sabbath any day you want. And they came up with all these different foreign doctrines that weren't taught in the scriptures by anyone. And so what ended up happening, the, 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 the noise went, the music went void. The Sabbath went void. The, the body of Christ went void. Up until the last days, because God says he's going to uh, you know, keep the message until the last days. So then what ended up happening, the Feast of Trumpets, See, the first time the Israelites were supposed to go into the Promised Land after Moses gave them the Ten Commandments, they never went into the Promised Land. Why? Because they disobeyed the commandments. So God made them walk around the desert for 40 years. But God also made them walk around the desert for 4,000 years. Because from the time they were supposed to go into the Promised Land the first time, they didn't go. Now, it's been 4,000 years till now. And now, they are going to go into the Promised Land. So the Feast of Trumpets is when he returned and he blew the trumpet and gathered his people together. He gathered, they gathered his people so they can start going towards the Promised Land. And that's been happening for years. And then the Day of Atonement is when we preached and taught all the people around the world. We, taught, we preached about it and we, we prayed for everyone around the world so that the people that are sinning unintentionally, they don't know about the Sabbath, they don't know about the Holy Days, they don't know about baptism, we can pray that God will you know, have mercy and have grace on them as well. And then the Feast of Tabernacles is when he sets up his kingdom in the kingdom of God. And so I just want you to read about that. Just, and, that and just, you know, that's a basic. That's called an elementary teaching for a lot of us that have heard this a lot of the time, especially people that are honoring the feast days. You already know that. But I wanted to share that because there's a lot of people on Facebook and there's a lot of people that may be watching this message that don't know that. So now what we're going to do is go through and look at the meaning of the Feast of Tabernacles in the Scriptures. So we're going to go back to the Scriptures now and... We're going to look at the Bible. First of all, I'd like to read the, the verse of the day. The verse of the day says, Praise to God. Uh, praise be to the God of the Father, our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. In his mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And that's exactly right. We have a new hope. And what is our hope? To be the first fruit to make it to the kingdom of God. So what I want to look at first, the first scripture I want to look at is in BibleGateway.com. We're going to look at Leviticus, because that's where the Feast of Tabernacles starts. So we're going to look at Leviticus. We're going to look at Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23, starting in verse 1. We're not going to read all of Leviticus 23, but this is where we're going to start, because this is where the feast days start. So it says, these are the appointed festivals. The first thing I want to point out here that's very important for you to understand, it says, the Lord said to Moses, who's the Lord? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is Lord. And this is a very important distinction because this is the one thing we didn't know before. We thought it was God in the Old Testament, and then all of a sudden Jesus came in the New Testament. But the Bible says that all things were created through Jesus. And so Jesus is Lord, he just had not become flesh yet. So it was Jesus who was talking to Moses. It was Jesus who led them through the Red Sea. It was Jesus who put the blood on the doorframe. It was Jesus the whole time. It wasn't God the Father. If you read the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, it says, I am the Lord, your God, who called you out of Egypt. So it's so important to understand. So when we're reading the context, you got to understand, everything we're reading is about Jesus. It's always been about Jesus. So look what it says. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, now, before we go into it, you got to understand, the only reason why he was only talking to the Israelites is because at that time, the Israelites were his only people. Now, these were not Jews. Jews came later. Jews is a, is a sect, is a denomination, is a group of people that actually um, are not the Israelites. There's a difference. So it's very important to understand the people that live in Israel today are people that call themselves Jews. And you, the Bible talks a little bit about them in Revelation 3 and Revelation 2. But the, the Israelites are a people. Remember, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob had 12 children. Those 12 children were um, the children of Israel because Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And so it's very important to understand that Israel is a man, not a land. There was never a land called Israel. 
when the Israelites were going to a land, they were going to the land of Canaan. And the reason why it was called the land of Canaan, because the Canaanites lived there. And so remember, they were supposed to go in and kill all the giants and all the Canaanites, and they were afraid to do it. That's why they walked around the desert in the first place. Because the Israelites were supposed to go take over the Canaanites. So it's very important to understand there's a big difference. So this is very important. So that's why the Lord is speaking to the Israelites at that time. But you'll see later on how it ties directly into you that are watching this message today. It says, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, these are my appointed festivals. The appointed festivals of the Lord, who you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. So for God's people, which at that time were only the Israelites, well, when Jesus came now, everyone is an Israelite that's baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. But then it said, these are my appointed festivals. And this is very important to understand. They're not the Jews' appointed festivals. They're not Jewish appointed festivals. They're not the Christians' appointed festivals. They're not my appointed festivals. They are the Lord's appointed festivals. They are Jesus Christ's appointed festivals. That we are God's people, disciples of Jesus, the Israelites, the, 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 the uh, people that have come into the fold, the Gentiles that now have been baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. It's their appointed festivals, not the Jews' appointed festivals. It says, these are my appointed festivals, the appointed festivals of the Lord, which you are to proclaim the sacred assembly. And the very first of the appointed festivals is the Sabbath day. It says, there are six days you may work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath rest, sacred assembly. You are to not do any work wherever you live. It is a Sabbath to the Lord. And so it's very important to understand that feast day was created in Genesis. It wasn't created in Exodus. It was created for all mankind. And, the, and Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, just like he's Lord of everything else on earth. Of course he's Lord of the Sabbath. He's Lord of everything. So of course we honor the Sabbath because we get to, not because we have to. See, it's, so, it's such a privilege when we start honoring the Sabbath, how God showed us that we get to honor the Lord. We get to be at his feet. We get to worship with him every single week. We get to look up, see his creation, and know exactly when to honor him. Because it's not on Sunday. There's no Sunday in the Bible. You notice it says the seventh day. There is no Gregorian calendar in the scripture, so it can't possibly be the seventh day. You spot the new moon, and you count to seven. So that's how you get to the true seventh day. So this is so important to understand. And the Lord revealed this to us, and when we saw them, we were like, wow! And we went and shared it with our family, with our friends, and, you know, it wasn't really accepted as, as well as it should have been, but that's okay, because the first will be last, and the last will be first. And so it's so encouraging how God um, shared that message with us. So you got to understand, these are the Lord's appointed festivals. So how does that, uh, you know, pertain to us today? Let's look at what the Feast of Tabernacles means now. So let's look over at, and um, we're going to start with Matthew 24. Matthew 24, Matthew 24, we're going to start in verse 36. Now, by the way, get your pens and paper out, and I recommend you to get your Bible out, because we go through Scripture. We go through a lot of Scripture in the Bible, and I want you to not only just believe my words, I want you to write down the Scriptures, and, you know, double-check what we say, what we say, because, you know, you're supposed to be a Berean. And Bereans, you know what they do? They examine the Scriptures to see if what Paul says is true. So I want you to examine the scriptures to see if what I say is true as well. So look at Matthew 24. We're going to go down to Matthew 24 because this is the time when the Bible is talking about the last days. We're going to go to Matthew 24. We're going to start in verse 36 because this is a very important passage to understand. This is talking about what's going to happen at the end times. It says, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. Now, this is a very important thing about parables. Most people don't know that the Bible talks in parables. If you read Matthew 13, he talks about the parable of the sower and there's four different types of seed. And then he says, the secrets to the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not to them. So there's certain secrets that God reveals only for the people that are going to obey him. And then there's others that don't understand these secrets, and he talks to them in parables, so they can't get it. You understand? That's Matthew 13. You can read that. Okay? So it's very important. So this is one of those parables. About that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. But if you read Amos 3.7, that's the, the message from our, our website, and, and it's on the scripture, Amos 3.7, he says a very important sentence. He says, the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plans to his servants, the prophets. 
So when I saw that scripture, Amos 3, 7, I said to myself, okay, one of two things are correct. Either no man's going to know when Jesus is going to come, or the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. Both of them can't be right. <laughs> so I said, I, I need to understand which one is right. Well, let's keep reading the scriptures and we'll see which one is right. The Bible says in verse 37, it says, as it was in the days of Noah, so will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So when I saw that, I started saying, well, God, I need to look at the days of Noah. Because it says it's going to be like the days of Noah, so I need to understand what happened in Noah's day. And so it says, in the days before the flood, people were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. Up until the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. This is how it will be with the coming of the Son of Man. So when I looked at that scripture, I was like, wait a minute. There's two groups of people there. You got Noah and his seven people and his family. And then you got everyone else that was eating, drinking, marrying, and giving them marriage. In other words, asleep, not paying attention. And then you had Noah that knew exactly when to get on the ark. So I asked the question, did Noah know when to get on the ark? Well, I had to look in the Bible. And if you look in the Bible, and I think it's in um, uh, Exodus, no, I'm sorry, Genesis 7. God said to Noah, in seven days I'm going to flood the earth, so get on the ark. And so guess what? God did exactly what he said he does. He told his servants when to get on the ark. Everyone else was eating, drinking, marrying, and giving a marriage. In other words, not paying attention to his appointed times. So this is so important. This is how it ties into us today. We're supposed to be paying attention to his appointed times because no one knew exactly when to get on the ark. And so did all the animals. So did all his sheep. When they heard the voice of God, they followed and went into the ark. It's so, it's so important. Because look what it says. It says, this is how it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know when the day the Lord will come. So the, the thing that I did uh, 10 years ago, my wife did and my family did, my mom did, we persevered and we said, we need to know what day that is. How did that work? We need to understand how it's going to happen, how it's going to come together. How do we know what to be looking for? Because he says to look and watch. So how do we know what to look for and watch for? So that's what we did. And so it's been really so encouraging. So I want to show you a couple of scriptures on that. Because God last night showed me a couple other things to look for. Look at Psalms. By the way, if you want to learn about the days of Noah, you can read about that in Genesis 6. In Genesis 7, 8, and 9, you can read all about the days of Noah, and I would recommend you to do that so you can really understand what happened. So um, this is Psalms 27. Psalms 27, starting in verse 1. This is the story of David. Uh, about David, this is one of David's prayers, because um, the Bible says in the last days, there's seven churches. One of the church is the church of Philadelphia, which we believe we are helping lead the church of Philadelphia. And, and that was the church after God's own heart, because David was a man after God's own heart. And it says, um, you have the keys of David. If you read Revelation 3, verse 7 and 14, the church of Philadelphia has the keys of David. So we're going to read about David in this parable. It says, in this passage, Psalms 27, it says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? So, again, we're talking about the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> when the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Through my army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Through war break out against me, even then I will be confident. I want to stop there because it's so encouraging. Over the last few weeks I've been reading scriptures, and I just watched, and you can look in the, in the commandments, you can look in the Old Testament, and you can see how every time the Israelites had the Ten Commandments, they were powerful. They were powerful. Um, there's a scripture, and actually I read the book of Jasher too. You can look at the Bible references of the book of Jasher. And it was so cool because I think it was Reuben and, um, Reuben and one of the other brothers of the Israelites, two men, went to the entire town of the Canaanites and wiped out over 400 men. You know why? Because the Lord was fighting for them. Two Israelites wiped out the two, 400 Canaanites. And then they, everybody used to be afraid of the Israelites back in the day. If you read the book of Jasher, you read some of these other books in addition to the Bible, it's amazing because God shows you how powerful the Israelites when they kept the commandments. 
And of course, this was before they left into the, left to go to the promised land. They were afraid. People were afraid, terrified of them because they knew the Lord was fighting for them. And that's why David was not afraid. And that's why we aren't afraid. Yeah. We're not afraid of the stuff that's going on in this world at all. Here's why. Because the Lord fights for us. And we got stories after stories. Over this next week, we'll tell you some of the stories of some of the things that God has done for us. So this is the heart you got to have. Look what it says. Verse 4, it says, One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek. And this is what you should be seeking. True disciples of Jesus should be seeking this. If you have a heart of David, if you have a heart that, that David has, and David says he loves the Lord, he loves the law, he loves the commandments. You can read about that in Psalms 119. David loved the commandments. That was the whole thing of David. That's what made him a man after God's own heart. But look what he sought. It says that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. That's what we should be seeking. See, I used to seek all kinds of other stuff. I used to seek my business. I used to seek my career. I used to seek a family. I used to seek um, wanting to be successful. I used to seek wanting to be a top network marketing distributor. I used to want to be run a, run a I can worldwide program. I used to seek all this worldly stuff. But if you look at the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews 11, you know what they sought? The kingdom of God. And they sought from afar. For 4,000 years, they've been seeking the kingdom of God. And that's what made them righteous. They weren't looking at the world. They weren't looking at all this worldly stuff. They weren't looking at what they can get and how great they're going to make this life and their 401k plan. They were looking at the 401k plan and the kingdom of God. Amen. They were looking at, I want to be at the, at the feet of Jesus and wash his feet. I want to be on that throne judging the 12 tribes of Israel. I want to seek the Lord. And that's what David saw. And that's who the church of Philadelphia is. They seek the Lord. And that's what all these brothers in Africa and India, these four other countries, when they see the scriptures, they say, Amen, the word of God has come to me. I'm going to seek the Lord. They have nothing else to seek. They don't have a dime in their pocket, but they seek the Lord. And that's what the David did. Let's keep reading. Verse 5, it says, For in the days of trouble, which is now, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. Well, where does Jesus dwell? In heaven. In heaven. So it says he's going to keep David safe, the church of Philadelphia, safe in his dwelling. Well, let's see where that dwelling is. Look what it says. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent. If you do a translation, if you go to the King James Version or the New King James Version, that actually says his shelter. See, the Feast of Tabernacles is when we go to a temporary shelter. That's what it is. And if you translate it, it says tabernacle. We're going to be in his tabernacle. It says we will be dwell, keep, him safe, keep him safe from trouble. In other words, a trouble that's going to come on earth, which you'll see in a little bit. It'll keep him safe in his dwelling and hide me in his shelter, sacred tent. But where is it going to say, hide him safe? High upon the rock. Well, that's interesting because when I read the days of Noah, if you read about the days of Noah where the, where the ark landed, it says it landed on top of Mount Ararat. And you can read about that in Genesis 7, 8, 9 or so. You can read about that. and It says it's going to land on Mount Ararat. And Mount Ararat is a mountain, which is called a rock. So it's interesting. It says it's going to be like in the days of Noah. And, it, the, it, and Noah into the ark on a certain day, and then it landed up on top of a rock at the end. And the Bible says that we, in the time of trouble, are going to land in his dwelling on a rock. And we're going to be in his tent. You see, you got to understand that means we're going to be in the kingdom of God. That God talks to people that are honoring him in plain English. So if you're hearing this message, those who have hear, ears, let them hear. So I hope you that are seeing this message are inspired because that's what the Lord says he's going to do. He is going to honor us for it. But let's keep reading. It says, Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. And at his sacred tent, in other words, the kingdom of God, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. And I will sing and make music to the Lord. That's what we're going to be doing in the kingdom of God. We're going to be making music to the Lord. We're going to be singing to the Lord. It's going to be such a joyful time. Man, I can't wait to go see Noah. I can't wait to ask you questions about building that ark. I can't wait to go see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the brothers um, that, that went before us that honored the Lord. 
That's what we're going to be doing. This is a festive time. That's why the Lord wants us to go for seven days. And it's interesting, it's going to be a seven-year tribulation. So that, that seven days, we, he wants to um, do a, um, a dress rehearsal. For what's coming in the future, like Colossians 2, 16 says, it's a foreshadow of things to come. So that's what we're doing right now. Right now, we're, we're practicing what we're going to be doing in the kingdom of God. That's why this is an exciting time. This is the first day of a feast. Imagine the first day you get to the kingdom of God. How are you going to feel? Are you going to be just kind of bored? Oh, God, what are we going to do today? No, no, you're going to be fired up the first day you make it to the kingdom of God. I know I am. I got a whole notepad of stuff I got to talk about. I'm going to be running off the mouth, asking people questions, interviewing. What's going on? It's going to be a fun time in the Lord. And this is the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, so this should be a fun day for you. And for our kids, we're going to have a great day for our kids. We're going to have a fun time with our family and start to worship and honor our family in the same exact way. And so this is what the Lord says to do. Let's keep reading. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says to you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. That needs to be your heart. Do not hide your face from me and do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God my Savior. This is the mindset you should have. If you haven't been honoring the feast days up to this point, let's say you've been honoring the pagan holidays that the Lord um, you know, tells us not to like Christmas and Easter and all the other ones that I used to honor as well. If you've been honoring those and you haven't been honoring the feast day, you should get on your knees today and beg this just like David did. Just please don't forsake me. Please um, forgive me for my sins. Please allow me to be the first fruit and make it to the kingdom of God. I am so sorry from this point on I repent. See, 10 years ago when the Lord shared this with us, guess how long it took for me to repent? Instantly. We saw that it, it was kind of interesting because me and my wife, it was right around the time of Passover, right before Passover actually, when we first learned about this in April of 2010. And as soon as we saw it, I saw that Easter was a you know, pagan holiday. There's no Easter in the Bible. There's no Easter eggs. It's a Passover. But um, I said, I didn't honor no Easter. My wife didn't know that she wasn't 100% on board yet. So she heard the kids were out planting out Easter eggs. I'm in the house. I said, I ain't planting no Easter eggs. No way. I ain't honoring no pagan holiday because I see it in the scriptures. And how many times do I need to see something in the scriptures for it to be true? Once. So once I saw it, that was immediate response. Same thing with the Sabbath day. Same with all the other holidays. As we started learning about this, God started purifying our hearts and getting us out of this paganism around the world. And so that's the same thing. So if you're watching this on Facebook, you're watching this on one of these videos, and you're watching this message, and you, and you realize that, man, I haven't been honoring these feast days. I need to honor these feast days from now on. Amen. That's what repentance is for. That's what grace is for. Jesus gave with grace and truth to give us time to repent. Amen. That's what grace is. It's time. He gave us 2,000 years to repent, and that grace period is almost over. So let's keep reading. Verse 10, it says, Through my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your ways, the Lord. Lead me in straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes or for false witnesses who rise up against me, sprouting malicious accusations. And that's another heart you should have is to teach me. you got to have a teachable heart. you got to have a humble heart to say, God, I don't know everything. Man, I didn't even know these feast days. I didn't even know how the Sabbath day worked. I've been doing it the wrong way for a long time. That was our heart when we first learned this. We were humbled. God, I remember, Jay, we were so humble. We'd go to some of these messages, and when we used to go to church, our message used to be like three scriptures, a couple songs, and, and a couple stories. It was really cool. I mean, it was uplifting. We had a great fellowship. We had a lot of friends and everything. But then we go to some of these other groups, and man, they talk for two straight hours, showing scripture after scripture. All the kids were in the congregation. The kids weren't in some club somewhere in the back. The kids were in the congregation, and the kids were up there worshiping and singing the songs, and they were learning the scriptures. And we were like humble. It was, it was overwhelming. We'd like read like 20 scriptures in a three-hour session. I remember we went to some message, one message at a, at a, at a church one time, and we didn't know, how, know this how this worked. But my wife and I, it was pretty cool. We went to this service at a, at a, um, at a hotel. And it was in, in Fullerton, uh, in uh, Pasadena. Or, no, no, um, Pomona. And we went to this hotel. We get there. And there was only a, a couple people there, like three or four people. There was an older, older couple. 
And so there was some chairs set up and they were in a hotel room and we were facing the wall and it was really funny. So we're, we're facing this wall, we're like, okay, and they had food out, we're like, okay, well maybe the service is gonna start in a little bit. So we get our kids and we sit down and to honor the service facing the wall, looking out the window. And there's a podium up there. So we're sitting there waiting for the guy to come up and start preaching. All of a sudden we hear a stereo radio behind us <laughs> playing a guy speaking and singing songs. I was like, what's going on here? <laughs> what's going on? So as we're watching, listening to this message, um, the, everybody else is sitting in the back. We're sitting there staring out of a wall. And so this message, the guy started preaching. It's just kind of like I'm doing, but he was from South Carolina or North Carolina somewhere preaching the message. And I was like, wow. So we were like, okay, let's take message, take notes. So we're taking notes and notes and notes. And it goes on for 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. Our first message is we sat there for four hours looking out a window at no one. Listening to a guy on the radio. And no one else showed up. It was us, two other couples, and our, and, and our friends. And that was it. And so we left out there and we were like, okay, God. <laughs> we just left this phenomenal co congregation. This is a group. My wife had a headache. We were hungry. We didn't know what to do. We were, had two young kids. And we were like, God, what do we do? Is this the place for us? We prayed because, you know, God said... We're going to go wherever we need to go. And, if, and we said, God, if this is where you want us to be, then amen. This is where we're going to be. But God told us to go keep looking. So we did. We went and looked at other places, looked at other congregations. And we ended up landing in a place down in, in uh, Temecula. And we stayed there for two years because the preacher there, it was kind of like our congregation. The kids would come up and sing, and it was joyful, had great music, and they did great lessons. They were about an hour and a half, two hours long. And, but we started learning at this guy's feet. Man, they taught us so much about the scriptures. We felt so stupid. We were like, good night. I've been a disciple for 10 years, and I know nothing about the Bible. Virtually everything I had learned was wrong. It was inaccurate, with the exception of baptism for forgiveness of sin and how to be a disciple. <laughs> and I was so humble. And we just sat at their feet, and we learned for two years, and then God pulled us out and started teaching us more about the scriptures. But that needs to be your heart. If you're watching this message and you're on Facebook or you're watching this message as a video, you're online with this live right now, you should be saying to yourself, you know what? I need to humble myself. I need to learn the scriptures because I know elementary teaching. If you look at the Bible, the elementary teachings in Hebrews 6, baptism is an elementary teaching. We don't even hardly teach baptism here because most of the people we teach, they already understand baptism. We don't need to talk about that that much. They, they get that. We teach about the advanced teachings, which is the feast days and and his coming and all the other things that God wants us to learn. And so that's the mindset of a of, of, of person of David, of, of the Church of Philadelphia. So that's the mindset we need to have. Let's keep reading. It says, verse 13, I remain confident in this. I will see goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart. Wait for the Lord. And that's what we should be doing right now, waiting for the Lord. And I can't wait. I, I, I wait with bated breath every Sabbath, every feast day, every holy day. I am waiting for the Lord. And you should be too. So this is an inspiring passage of Scripture. And so let's look at a few other things here. Let's look at you know, um, how we're waiting for the Lord and some ways that we're waiting for the Lord and what we're waiting for. Let's look at 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, we're going to start in verse 20. Because we've got to understand how this all works. So 1 15, uh, uh, Corinthians 15, starting in verse 20, it says, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. So Jesus was the first fruit. Remember, he died on Passover, he was buried on unleavened bread, and he rose as the first fruit. So he was the first fruit among many brethren. So he's the first fruit. So look at what it says here. And it's so cool. It says, Since death came through a man, Adam, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man, Jesus. For in Adam all die, for in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn. And this is where you need to focus and pay close attention. Is the turn. Because you don't want to be out of turn. You know, you want to be in line and in turn. So it says, Christ, comma, which means Christ was the first fruit. He was the first to raise from the dead. Then it says, the first fruits, which is the body of Christ. 
the people that have been baptized for the forgiveness of their sins and keeping the commandments of God. You're going to see that as we go. In other words, the church of Philadelphia, there's a group of people that are called first fruit of the Lord, which is the Lord right now is going around the world, finding his sheep, he, looking for the people that are hearing his voice, repenting from their sins, and getting baptized for the forgiveness of their sin and keeping his covenant from the heart. So that's what the Lord's looking for right now. Those are called first fruit. Then the next group is, then, when he comes, those who belong to him. That's a totally different group. And you're going to see that as we go on through the scriptures. So there's three groups. Christ is the first one. We can't be Christ, so we can't be him. Then there's the first fruit, which is what you want to be. That's the goal. And then the next goal is to be those who, when he comes, who belong to him. You don't want to be that group if you don't have to. Some are going to have to because they won't repent now. And you're going to see that as we go. But if you are hearing this message right now, and today is before the Lord has come, and we're still on earth, and the, and the church of Philadelphia is still here, people are not gone. People haven't disappeared yet, like a twinkle of an eye. That still hasn't happened yet, you're watching this message? Guess what? You still got hope. You still got time to be the first fruit. And the way you do it is you repent. So the goal is to be the first fruit of the Lord. Let's read some scriptures on some timing, so you can understand when that happens. Let's look at 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. We're going to look at 2 Thessalonians 2. Starting at verse 1. 2 Thessalonians 2, starting at verse 1. The man of lawlessness. Because you've got to understand timing in the scriptures. God is not going to do anything without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. And the servants are the people that are honoring him and keeping his covenant. That's why he's revealing this stuff to you. That's what we read what it says. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him. So read, write that down right now. This is the time period. When you're reading the Bible, you've got to read the words of the Bible, not read over the Bible. Yeah. See, a lot of times years ago, I used to just kind of read the scriptures. Here's how I would have read this before. Concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and the coming of gathering him, we, uh, you brothers and sisters, uh, not to be easily unsettled, I would have just read through it. But now what I've learned to do is learn to read every word. He said, those who hang on every word from the mouth of God. So let's read it slowly. Concerning the coming of our Lord, Jesus Christ, and our being gathered to him. So that's the time period we're talking about, which happens on a feast day or near a feast day. Actually, it happens on the day that no man knows, which we just read in Noah's day. It says, coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, do not be easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by prophecy or by word of mouth or letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. See, a lot of people have been taught that Sunday is the day of the Lord. I've, I've had a lot of people say that. Sunday is the day of the Lord. You know, there's nowhere in the scripture that Sunday is the day of the Lord. There's no way that the Sabbath is the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord has not come yet. But see, a lot of people believe that the day of the Lord has come already. But the Bible says it hasn't. So let's keep reading. Don't let anyone deceive you in this way. For that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. So we need to be looking for that. So that's what I looked for the last year. Well, what lawlessness has happened? Well, look at the world today. Well, what does lawlessness mean? In scripture, lawlessness, what is the law? The commandments. The holy day. Let me ask you this. Is the world right now getting rid of the commandments out of church? Yes. Yes. Is it getting rid of the commandments out of schools? Yes. Is it getting rid of it out of business? Is it taking the Ten Commandments off of government buildings? Yes. You see, the, the commandments have always been the problem. Because when people had the commandments, they had power. See, when the Israelites had the commandments, the Lord was with them. When the, Lord, when the commandments are taken away, the Lord ain't with you no more. So that's why Satan hates the commandments. So look what it says. It says the law, man of lawlessness is revealed. In other words, this man has to stand up. So the Lord revealed to us. We have a video called um, the, the Man of Sin is revealed on our YouTube channel. You can watch that video. It reveals who that man of sin is. And his name is 666. And you'll see that in a little bit. So these two things are happening right now. It's the worst time of lawlessness we've ever seen. Most people don't know, if you go on YouTube or on Facebook right now, there is riots going on all around the world right now. Protests and riots. Even our president, look at our president nomination thing. If you guys saw that on TV, it was a fiasco. 
They're bickering back and forth and arguing and all kinds of craziness. There's no godlessness here. Bickerness and, and lawlessness is like the Bible says. It says he will oppose himself above everything that is called God or is worship so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming to be God. Let's keep reading. It says, don't you remember that when I was with you, I told you to, to um, tell you these things? And now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed, here's the key, at the proper time. See, he had just got revealed just, just a couple weeks ago. I just did that video on who the man of sin is in very detail. And that message went around the world. So the man of sin just got revealed recently. Look what it says. For the secret powers of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who's holding him back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, um, who the Lord will overthrow with his breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. See, when Jesus comes, he is going to um, destroy that man of lawlessness. <coughs> by the way, can you give me some water, please? <coughs> He's going to destroy that man of lawlessness. So he hasn't come yet and been revealed to the world. He was revealed to his servants because the Lord said he does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants. So the man of lawlessness has been revealed already, but he hasn't been revealed to the world yet because he hasn't shown up yet. But it says when he does come, the Christ is going to take him and get him out of here. Look what it says. The coming of the lawlessness will be accordance of how Satan works, and he will all sorts of displays and powers and signs and wonders serve the light. And all the ways that wickedness deceive those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Thank you. Very important to understand. The reason why people will not be saved is because they refuse to love the truth. And that's why our ministry called Saved by Truth, we teach the truth of what the scripture says. See, they refuse to love the truth. They, refer, they prefer to keep believing what they've been taught versus believe what the Bible actually says. So it's so important. Look what it says. And all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and they'll be saved. Verse 11. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so they will believe the lie so that they will be condemned who have not, who have not believed the truth and delighted in wickedness. This is something that we need to have a healthy fear of the Lord for. See, if you choose to look at this message, let's say you're watching this video right now and you say, oh, that's hogwash. Sunday's when the Sabbath is, or Saturday is when the Sabbath is, or the people that call themselves Jews are God's people, not the Israelites, the people that call themselves Jews are. And, and you start to keep believing the lines that you've been taught. The Bible says, God says, okay, no problem, keep doing that. Now I'm going to send you a powerful delusion, and you'll believe the lie, so you will perish. In other words, in, in real life time, that means you will go through the great tribulation. You will not be the first fruit. You'll be the second group, which you'll learn about in a moment. So this is very important. See, this is all about the tabernacle with the Lord. Everything we're showing you right now is about tabernacle with the Lord. This is about when Jesus comes to gather his people. We just read that at the beginning. This is about tabernacling with the Lord. So he wants you to know the time he's coming. And this time is here right now. So this is the time to have a healthy fear of the Lord and be a Berean like we've been taught. I know when I was a disciple, one of the things they taught me is, bro, you need to be a Berean. Don't just take my word for it. You need to believe the scriptures. Obey what the Bible says, not just me. Read the scriptures. So I'm challenging every one of you that are watching this right now to do the same thing. Yep. You need to be a Berean and examine the scriptures to see what God says is true, not your pastor or your minister or, or your brother or your discipleship partners or anybody else. What the Bible says is true. And this is awesome. So I love how the Lord... Reveals this to his people. So the key here is one, is you want to be first fruit. And two, you want to be gathered to him. So we're going to look at a little bit of that. So let's look at how that takes place. Let's go to, go to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5, starting in verse 1. Now it talks about the day of the Lord. <laughs> so... We're going to talk about what the day of the Lord is. Because like I said, the day of the Lord, a lot of people have been told it's on Sunday or it's on, on Saturday or it's on Friday night and Saturday night. And let's see what the day of the Lord really says, what the Bible says. It says, now, brothers and sisters, again, we now know who he's talking to. He's talking to baptized disciples that are here watching his message. That's who he's talking to. Brothers and sisters. That's what we call each other in the, in the body of Christ, brothers and sisters. About the times and dates, we don't need to write you. 
For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. You see? You see? Now, the reason why he says that, it's so cool. We learned about this. He says that, brothers and sisters, we don't need to tell you the days of... You know why he didn't need to tell them? Because they were honoring his feast days. They were honoring the Sabbath day. So they he didn't have to go and tell them the days of the time because they knew. Just like we know. And so you got to ask yourself, do I know? Do I know the days and times? Do I know this information? Or is this my first time hearing it? If this is your first time hearing it, amen. Thank the Lord that you're here hearing it. Because the Bible says the first will be last and the last will be first. So look what it says. It says it will come like a thief in the night. Write that down, thief in the night. If you notice, it doesn't say he's going to come like a thief in the day. There's nowhere in Scripture that doesn't say that. It says he's going to come like a thief in the night. And this is so encouraging for all of us. It says, while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. So, you got to look at the world. Do the world be talking about peace and safety? As a matter of fact, just last month they had a day of peace on the 21st of September. The world's talking about peace and safety, and over in the land called Israel, they made a peace treaty over there right now. So the world's talking about peace and safety. As a matter of fact, the folks going around right now talking about peace and safety, gathering all these different religions together to have one world religion so they can have peace and safety. Isn't it interesting that the Bible tells us about that day and time? We need to know, and we can see it right now for the first time in history. Because up until the internet, you could never see this happening around the world. But now, from the comfort of your own home, from your cell phone, you can see the entire world talking about peace and safety. Never before in the history of mankind has that ever been possible. Until now. That's how we know this is the end time. Very important. Let's keep reading. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so this day should not surprise you as a thief. So he's telling you those are two different people. There's some people it's going to surprise them like a thief. And then there's some people that it's not going to surprise them like a thief. It ain't going to surprise me. It's not going to surprise St. Martin's ministry. It's not going to surprise the brothers and sisters around the world preaching the message that are honoring the feast days today. It ain't going to surprise them like a thief. It's going to surprise the ones that are sleeping that say, oh, those commandments are nailed to a cross. Or all those Sabbath days was a Jewish feast. We don't need to honor that. We need to honor Christmas and Easter and Valentine's Day and Halloween. That's who's going to come to as a thief. Let's keep reading. But you, brothers and sisters, you are not in darkness. <clears throat> So that this day should surprise you like a thief. You're all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the light, the night, or the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. <laughs> you see, God's telling you, you need to be awake. And all of you that are watching this right now, it is so encouraging that you are all awake. Because you're here. You're being woken right now. It's kind of like God's shaking you up. Wake up. You, you know, my kids, who, uh, matter of fact, we were at the store the other day, and we, uh, I saw this little hook thing. It's on this stick. It's a hook thing. And uh, it has a little ball at the end. And we were going to bite because, you know, my kids, sometimes it's hard to wake them up in the morning. And we got to, like, shake them up and wake them up and stuff. And I was like, we should find this hook thing and just drag it right out of bed. Boom, and throw them under the floor. <laughs> you know, that's kind of what God's doing to us right now. That's what God might be doing to you right now. Try to wake you up. Wake up. Get your foot on the bed. Wake up. It's time to wake up. Because, you know, the Lord's coming. So that's what God's right now doing. He's trying to wake us up so we're not asleep. Let's keep reading. Verse 4, verse 7, it says, For those who sleep, sleep at night. For those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate. In other words, protect the heart. And hope of salvation as a helmet. What does a helmet do? It protects your head. What should you be focused on? Salvation. Not this world, not having a great life, not worrying about your retirement plan and what you're going to do for the next 15, 20 years. It ain't happening. The Lord's coming, and he's coming soon. We're in a dress rehearsal right now for the real thing that's coming soon. See, look what it says. It says, for God not, did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us, so that whether if we are awake or asleep, we may to live together with him in the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just in fact that you are doing. And that's what I'm doing today, you guys. I'm encouraging you. I'm inspiring you. It doesn't matter if I'm asleep or awake or physically asleep or awake because I'm wide awake. 
And most of you that are watching this right now, hopefully you are wide awake because the Lord did not appoint you to suffer wrath, which is about to come on the whole world. To humble them. So this is what the day of the Lord really looks like. You notice it don't say nothing about Sunday or Saturday or Friday night or Saturday night or any other day like that. This is what the day of the Lord really looks like. And so it's so exciting and so inspiring. So one, you want to be the first fruit. Two, you want to be prepared and waiting to gather for him. Three, you want to be looking up and praising the Lord and thanking him for giving you this time and bringing you to this message so you can hear this message. You want to have a heart of David so that you um, love the commandments, you love the law, you love his holy days. You said, you made a decision, I'm going to repent from this point on, never again while I'll break the Sabbath day. I'm going to tell you right now, a, a friend of mine called me the other day and said, you know, Stephen, today is a Feast of Tabernacles and, um, you know, I accidentally booked an appointment on this day. Should I go work? Should, should I, what, what should I do? And I said, bro, you know, I can't tell you what to do. That's not my job. My job is not to tell you what to do. I can just tell you what I would do. Um, if somebody came to me today and knocked on my door and said, Stephen, I got a billion dollars for you right now. A billion cash. Here's the cash. Got a, a suitcase full of cash. I'm going to give you this billion dollars. If you would just leave this service right now and just come and do some work for me because I need some coaching. I need some real help. I got a big appointment. I need some help. I'll give you a billion dollars cash right now. You know what I'd say? I said, man, I appreciate that. Thank you so much for that. But, you know, I, I, I can't help you, but I can help you tomorrow. Or I can help you, you know, later on in the week. But today, you know, I'm honoring the Lord. I, can't, I don't break the Sabbath day for any amount of money. Well, how about I give you $10 million? I got $10 million cash right here. You know, I'm a multi-billionaire. I'm going to give you that cash. You know, I really appreciate that. <clears throat> Thank you so much for that. But, you know, that, it's not going to work for me today. But if, you're wait, if you can wait until tomorrow, I'd be happy to come and serve you tomorrow. But today I serve the Lord, and I don't break the Sabbath day for any amount of money. Um, I wouldn't break the Sabbath. Isn't that kind of what happened with Jesus when Jesus was on top of the mountain? What did Satan say? I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world. I'll give you money and jewels and everything if you just come and bow down and worship me. I would never break the Sabbath day. If someone came to the door and said, you know, um, you got to stop this Sabbath service. I'm going to shoot you in the head if you don't come and if you don't stop breaking, if you don't break the Sabbath right now and stop this and stop worshiping the Lord like this. I said, well, go do what you got to do. The Lord will protect you. And I wouldn't do it at all. It's like Meshach and Shadrach and Abednego. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego had to go into the fire. And there was a third, a fourth person walking in there with a fire, unbound and unchained. And guess what? They walked out of the fire. They didn't even smell like smoke. Why? Because they trusted the Lord. That's how much I trust the Lord. Let me ask you, would you trust the Lord like that? Would you break the Sabbath day for money to go to work? God says you can't love God and money. So would you go to work and break the Sabbath day now that you know how the Sabbath day works? You see, if it lands on a Friday, would you go to work on a Friday and do money for it? Or would you tell your boss, I can't work on the Sabbath day and defy the man and defy the system? See, we haven't worked and broken the Sabbath day in 10 years and there ain't nothing that would make me or my family break the Sabbath day. And so this is what it means right here. See, this is I'm telling you the Lord does not appoint us for wrath. And this is what the Lord wants. He wants you to honor him. So let's look. Let's look at a few more scriptures. Because, and, and see, like I said, in our, in our message, man, we, we teach the Bible. We let the Bible do the talking. And so I know I do a little commentary between to make it fun and stuff. But the Bible is doing the talking right now to you. And I hope you're hearing this message. I pray everyone that's watching this, all you on Facebook that are watching this message, you that may be watching the message around the world on, on, on these videos, I pray that this is hitting your heart and you're really understanding the meaning of this feast of tabernacles. So let's look at um, Romans. We're going to look at Romans 8. Romans 8. Romans 8, starting at verse 23. Romans 8, 23, it says, actually, let's start at verse 22. It says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Well, isn't it interesting? Well, God just said in what we read in Matthew that it's going to be like birth pains of childbirth when Jesus is going to come. Well, it says the whole creation has been groaning as pains in childbirth up to this present time. That's right. See, the Bible is living and active. It's present right now. So when this is talking about present time, it's talking about right now. Look what it says. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruit of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sonship, the redemption of our bodies. 
See, that's when we are changed at the twinkle of an eye, at the last trumpet. See, our body will be changed because we have the Holy Spirit inwardly. But soon, we're going to have a heavenly body just like the Lord has a heavenly body. And that's what we should be eagerly waiting for. That's what I'm waiting for with bated breath every single day. I walk out my house, I look up at the stars, and I pray to God every single night waiting for the Lord eagerly. Are you waiting for the Lord eagerly? Or are you waiting for you know, the next 5, 10, 20 years of your life so you can plan it out? What are you waiting for? See, the Lord tells us we should wait eagerly for him. Just like the brothers in, in, in the book of uh, Hebrews, you should read Hebrews 11, the whole chapter of Hebrews 11. Everybody there, guess what? They died waiting eagerly for the Lord 4,000 years ago. How much closer are we today? when we can see everything in the scriptures coming to fruition right now. That's what we should be eagerly waiting for. And it's so cool, because look what it says. Verse 24. For in this hope we are saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? See, if you already got everything you want, if you got your whole life and everything is doing great, you live this cushy great life, guess what? You have your reward in full. That's what the Bible says. See, but those that don't have anything, I have nothing. You guys, I don't own a house. Matter of fact, we got to move. We got to get out of here. We don't own this house. We don't own cars. We don't, I think we have a car that's paid off. But I don't have a car. We don't have nothing. We have no money. We have no 401k. We have no, no insurance policy. We got no, no, nothing to fall back on. You know what we got? The Lord and the truth. The Bible says the righteous will live by faith. And that's what we live by. We have the faith of God. It says, for this hope we are saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. If you got everything that you can see your whole life, and you can see everything about your life is right there in your face, guess what? That's no hope at all. Hope has to be unseen. See, heaven, we can't see heaven. You have to be hoping for the Lord. You better be hoping that the Lord comes to get you. Because look what it says. Verse 25. But if we have hope, for we have not seen, we wait patiently for it. See, this is... Powerful. And I'm going to read the next scripture, which is what my, was my favorite scripture. As a matter of fact, this is the scripture. I, I wasn't even planning on reading this, but the Lord just told me to right now. Because the day I, I started honoring the Lord, you know, 20 years ago, I was sitting in the car drinking a bunch of alcohol looking at the scriptures. I was a sinful man, but I was crying out to God, God, tell me, are you real? Is this Bible real? Are you, are you there? I want to know the Lord. I want to know what to do. And God showed me this one scripture. It says, And for all things God works for the good for those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. And I was like, wow, I heard that scripture in business for so many years. But I didn't understand it like that because it says, For God works for the good for those who love him. And I started doing some research on what it meant to love him. You know what the Bible says loving the Lord is? Keeping his commandments. You can read about that in John 14, verse 15. It says, If you love me, Keep my commandments. First John 1 through 5, it says, Loving God is keeping the commandments. And I was like, Wow, I wasn't keeping no commandments. I was breaking every commandment. And then some. I was inventing some new ways to break commandments. I wasn't even thinking about keeping the commandments. I was taught they were nailed to a cross. You ain't got to keep the commandments. But the Bible says, Loving the Lord is keeping the commandments. And I was like, Wow, all things work for the good for those who love Him. And I was like, Wow, God, thank you so much for showing me this. Because it says, For God foreknew, He also predestined. And he conformed in the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those who he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. In other words, we'd have a glorified body. Guess what that's talking about? The Feast of Tabernacles. When we are tabernacling with the Lord in our glorified body. And this scripture was the very first scripture the Lord showed me. 20 years ago, while sitting in the car drinking 40 ounces of Old English 800 beer, sitting there, looking at the scriptures, crying and crying out to God. Man, God brought me out so much. Sorry, guys. Let's keep going. But this is what the Lord wants us to do. He wants us to, to pay attention. Because this Feast of Tapping of Knuckles, this is such an awesome feast. Let's look at a Let's look at Mark. Mark. Mark 13. 
Mark 13, this is how, how God does it. Mark 13, starting in verse, let's see. Let's look at starting in verse 20. Mark 13, starting in verse 20. It says, if the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. So in other words, there's those days that, that the great tribulation is going to happen. He says he cuts those short for those elect. In other words, he cuts it right in the middle. Cuts it short. Like if you have a seven-day feast, maybe right in the middle, that's cut short, right? So he cuts it short for those who he has chosen. And he calls those the elect. So for the sake of the elect, those will be saved because he cuts it short because he knows calamity is about to come on earth. So he cuts it short. Let's read, see what it says. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, at there's the Messiah. There he is. Don't believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive even the impossible, even the elect. See, some will get deceived by this message, by, by the message that these messiahs are here or they're coming. As a matter of fact, the people that call themselves Jews, I don't know if you know this, you can Google this. They say the Messiah is in Israel right now. They've been having counseling with the Messiah. He's in the inner chambers. He hasn't revealed himself yet. Well, the Bible just says there's false messiahs and false prophets coming. And guess what? The people that call themselves Jews right now, where you can go online right now and see, they're saying right now that you can, the Messiah is on earth right now. I beg to differ. I think that's a false prophet. Let's keep reading. So be on guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. What does the Lord say he does? The sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. And so the Lord's telling us right here that he tells us ahead of time to watch out for those people that say that the Messiah is here on earth already. Let's keep reading. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give us light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, the people will see the Son of Man coming on a cloud with great power and glory. And he will send his angels to gather the elect. Who is he gathering? Remember we said you want to be focused on the first fruit? You want to be the elect. You want to be gathered together to go to meet in heaven. So look what it says. He's going to gather the angels and the elect. But let's find out where he's going to gather them from. From the four winds, from the ends of the earth, and to the ends of the heavens. In other words... These first fruit are going to be in heaven during that time. So that's what you want to find out. How does that happen? How do you get in heaven? Because there's nobody in heaven yet. Everyone that's died is asleep until the resurrection. So how do we get in heaven? Let's keep reading. Look what it says. Now listen to the lesson to the fig tree. As soon as the twigs get tender and leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things happening... You know that it is near, right at the door. So can you see all these things happening we've been talking about? Yes. Yes, you can see them happening right now, on your, right on your TV. So guess what? He says it's right at the door. Let's keep reading. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words never pass away. Guess what generation he's talking about? This generation will not pass away. The people that are here right now. It's so important. But here's the coolest part about this. Look at this. But about that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. This is a different one than Matthew. Because in Matthew 24 it says it. But let's read it in Mark. Look what it says. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when the time will come. Because remember he says no one's going to know. But did no one know when to get on the, bar, the boat? Yes, he knows exactly when to get on it because God told him. But let's see what the Lord says here. It's going to be like a man going away. He leaves his house to put his servants in charge with their assigned tasks, telling the one at the door to keep watch. So that's what we're doing right now. We are watching. We have brothers all around the world. Right now by the thousands, pastors and, and brothers and sisters all around the world in multiple countries around the world, teaching and warning the people and sharing the message to people all around the world to watch the Lord's coming. Look what it says. Therefore, keep watch. Because you do not know when the owner of the house will come. Look what it says. Whether in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or at dawn. Remember he said we're children of the, of the he's going to come like a thief in the night? 
And he tells us the time period he's going to come. He's going to come at evening. Evening is the period of time right before it gets dark. Or at midnight. At midnight. Or in the rooster crows. I looked it up last night. I googled when does the rooster crow. It said about 3 o'clock, 8, 3 a.m. 3 to 4 a.m. is when the rooster crows. Or at dawn before the sun comes up. Isn't that exactly the same time Jesus rose? On Passover. On the Feast of the First Fruit. He rose during that one of those times of the watch. Were that midnight? Or I mean, well, in the evening, at midnight, when the rooster crows are at dawn, because on the 17th day of the month, he was gone. Well, it's, it's interesting, if you look in the scriptures in, in Exodus, I'm sorry, in Genesis, Noah entered the ark on the exact same day. <laughs> it is interesting. <laughs> on that same day, that same time period, he entered the ark, and the door was shut, and the ark sailed. And it's amazing. Because the God, God tells us when he's going to come. So look what it says. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. In other words, you better be alert. You better be ready. You better have repented. You better be honoring the commandments. You better in your heart say, you know, I am going to honor the Sabbath day from this point on. I am going to honor the commandments from this point on. I am going to honor his feast days from this point on. I do need to be baptized in water for the forgiveness of my sin. There's no such thing as a sinner's prayer. I am going to be right with the Lord. It says, what I say to you, I say to everyone. Watch. If you notice, it doesn't say, just go live your life and go eat and drink and be merry. It tells us to watch. And this is why these feast days are so powerful. And this is why the Sabbath day is so powerful. Because every single week, guess what we're doing? Watch. We're alert. We're fired up for the Lord. I'm going to show you something else that's pretty cool. Look at this. I, it, Lord revealed all this stuff to me last night at like 4 in the morning again. <laughs> so he likes to talk to me at 4 in the morning. That, that's his time that he gets up early, so he likes to speak to me at that time. So look at this. Matthew 24. We're just going to look at this one part real quick. It's pretty cool. Because we're looking at the timing of the Lord. Matthew 24, verse 20. Look what he says. Uh, look what it says. Uh, let's, let's start at verse 18. It says, let no one go in the field, go back to the cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for a pregnant woman and nursing mother. Pray that your flight. <laughs> Ooh, amazing. But pray that your flight. Now, those who have ears left to be here. But it says, pray, pray that your flight will not take place in winter, which winter is until December, so it's not winter right now, or on the Sabbath. So the Feast of Trumpets is on the Sabbath day. So it can't be on that day. Uh, the Day of Atonement is on the Sabbath day. And the, the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles like today is on the Sabbath day. But this day it says, let your flight take place. And it's amazing he said the word flight out of all things. Because I don't think they even had airplanes back then, did they? I don't think they had airplanes back then. So he must be talking about the day of the Lord when there are airplanes around. Or when there are um, helicopters and stuff like that. I'm just saying, I'm just looking at the scriptures. It says your flight. Well, would they have wings to fly like a bird? What was he talking about their flight? Yeah, I, I don't know what he's talking about. But let's, leave, let's keep reading. It says, For there will be great distress and equal from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. In other words, after that flight, after these people are gone, it says there's going to be a great distress on the world from that point on. Imagine. I just want you to imagine this. Imagine. Just visualize. Close your eyes. Visualize this. Imagine one day. You're sitting there working, and you're working, or you're flying, or you're doing whatever you're doing, and anything could happen, any, anytime. And just all of a sudden, boom! All children are gone. Disappear, vanish. You go look for your kid. Johnny, where's Johnny? Where's my little child? Where's my kids? Kids have vanished. Clothes are laying around, kids are gone. But, and then you go start saying, wait, wait, wait. You call a couple of your friends, you call them up, you go, hey, where's my friends? They're gone. And th the news starts coming on. All these people have vanished and people have disappeared. And they start saying, oh, there's been an alien invasion. That's why we needed to have this space force that Trump has put in place. We need to have this space force to go fight against the aliens that have come and abducted all these people. People have been abducted for years, but now it's a mass abduction. All the children are gone and all these people are gone. And you're sitting there looking, well, I'm here. I'm a Christian. I've been honoring the Sabbath. I've been going to church every Sunday for 30, 40 years. I've been honoring the Bible and reading the scripture, but how come I'm still here? But all these people are gone. I don't understand. Let me call my friends up. You start calling your friends and the people you know that were honoring the commandments and honoring the Sabbath day. And you start finding out that 
they got something in common. They've been honoring the commandments, and I've been standing up there, and they're all gone, and all the children are gone. How are you going to feel? I know for me. I watched a movie years ago called Left Behind. I'd recommend to watch that movie tonight. Because I watched that movie, and there was one scene where there was this black preacher sitting up there on the podium. And uh, all the people had already disappeared, and he was still sitting there. And he was on that podium preaching. And he banged on that, pre that podium and said, I'm here. Why am I still here, Lord? I knew the scriptures. I taught the scriptures. I led people. But they're gone, and I'm still here. And he fell on his knees, and he cried out to God, oh, God, please. And, and he begged for mercy of his soul because he knew the great tribulation was coming. Because he taught it. He just didn't obey it. He, he saw it in scripture. He read the Bible, he just didn't believe what he read. His pride didn't allow him to see it. And when I saw that video 20 years ago, when I saw that video 20 years ago, I said, I don't want that person to be me. <laughs> so when I saw the Sabbath day, I made a decision, I don't care. I don't care what happens. I ain't never breaking the Sabbath day. I don't want to be that guy. Because look what it says in verse 22, it says, if those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be short. And that means cut. Maybe that feast was cut in half. I don't know. It's just those days will be shortened. So it's so important to understand all this is talking about the Feast of Tabernacles. This is the real meaning of the Feast of Tabernacles. See, we should be tabernacling with the Lord. We're going to be going to meet with Him. It's <laughs> so awesome. So awesome. See, there are two groups of people. There are the first group, and then there are people that are left behind that can become what's called the Great Harvest. And there's people teaching on both groups. Uh, the church we used to go to over in Temecula, guess what they're waiting for? They're waiting to be the harvest. They can't wait to go through the Great Tribulation. They say, man, it's going to be such an honor to die for my faith. And they are fired up for it. And I have people and pastors all over the world. They are fired up to go through the Great Tribulation. You know why? Because it's an honor. And it is a blessing to go through the Great Tribulation and die for your faith. It's an honor. But it's also an option. <laughs> so let me show you the option right now. Because you don't have to choose that. You can choose to be what's called first fruit. Most people don't know about the first fruit. Here's why. Because it's a secret of the kingdom of heaven. See, the Lord says in, in Matthew um, 13, he says, the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you and not to them. See, a secret is something that isn't taught to everyone. See, if it's taught to everyone, then it ain't a secret. A, a secret is taught to people that are obeying him, that are honoring the Sabbath day, that are coming to him, begging on their knees, that want to be the first fruit, that understand that they are the church of Philadelphia. That's who the secrets are taught to. See, because the Lord said, I do nothing without telling my plans to my servants, the prophets. So it's so important to understand that there are two options. So we're going to look at both of those options. So you get to choose. See, the Lord um, understands this. He understands that the first will be last and the last will be first. What that means is that you might have been honoring the Sabbath wrong or honoring Sunday or honoring Monday or honoring any day is the Sabbath or anything that you wanted to believe. You could have been doing that all this time. But today... Because God's grace is still here. He hasn't taken his grace period away. He said, you know, since you're here now, amen. Remember those ten, those ten, uh, the, 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 the ten sheep and one wandered, I mean, the hundred sheep and one wandered off, and that one comes back, he rejoices for that one sheep that comes back? You might be that one sheep. I want you to think about right now. You can say, man, I could be that one sheep. I'm here. You know, because I've invited thousands of people to this message. But you know, you might be that one sheep right now that's here that God has put on my heart, I'm going to humble myself today and I'm going to come watch that message now. You might be that one sheep that God's looking for. And you know what? You could be this first fruit. Let's read about the first fruit right now. Let's look. First, we have to read about the Church, church of um, Philadelphia so you can understand what the Church of Philadelphia is. Um, Revelation 3, and then we're going to see what those first fruit are and where they are. So Revelation 3, so the seven churches in the book of Revelation, six of those churches go through the great tribulation because God's mad with them. He tells you why he's mad with them. If you read the scripture, he tells you all why he's mad. But the church of Philadelphia is the only one that does not go through the great tribulation. And you're going to see that right now. Let's read. 
to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who are holy and true, who hold the keys of David. What are the keys of David? They keep the commandments. They love the law. They honor his Sabbath day. They, 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 they live for the Lord. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Here's the question. Do the people that call themselves Jews deny Jesus' name? Yes, they do. So how could they possibly be this group of people? They can't. Because they're not. So it says, you know, I will, it says, I will make those who are the synagogue of Satan, those who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. That is called the Great Tribulation. That's what's coming right now. That's what's about to happen. As soon as those children are gone, as soon as that, that, those elect are gone, and that twinkle of the night, the last trumpet, they go to the kingdom of God, it's going to be called then the hour of trial for everyone that's left on earth. So which do you want to be? Do you want to be the... Do you want to be the Sorry about that. You guys have a dog that started barking, and I apologize on that. So it's very important to understand do you want to be the first fruit? Do you want to go through the hour of trial? You have a choice. Which do you prefer? Look what it says. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. To the one who is victorious, I will make a pillar of the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write in them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the church. This is so important. So important. And to understand. This is the church of Philadelphia. I just want to say something right now. Satan is, Satan is so crafty. Satan is so crafty how right now, even during this message, Satan is trying to disrupt this message. But you know what? The Lord always prevails. Let's keep reading. That is the Church of Philadelphia. That's who you want to be. You want to be the Church of Philadelphia. So let's read. Now who they are. Let's read the first group. Revelation 14. 14. This is the Church of Philadelphia. The 144,000. Then I looked, and there before me was a lamb standing on Mount Zion. And with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their forehead. That's the Church of Philadelphia. Those are baptized disciples that are honoring the commandments now. It says, those are those 144,000. And I heard a sound from heaven, like the roar of rushing water, and a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard of that of a harpist playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the thrones, and before the four living creatures and the elder. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves from women, they remain virgins. In other words, the five wise virgin is not male or female. They're the five wise virgin. It says they follow the lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruit to God and to the lamb. No lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. If you notice, it's the first fruit of God. Jesus was the first fruit and these elect, these people are the first fruit. The group called first fruit. So it's so important to understand that's who the Lord is calling. Those are the 144,000. And you might think, oh, that's a symbolic number. Well, it's not symbolic at all. It's actually a real number. 144,000 is the exact number the Bible says. Because it says, it says many are called, but few are chosen. If you think about the days of Noah, it says it's going to be like the days of Noah, right? Well, how many people entered the ark? Eight. How many were on earth? Millions. That sounds like few. That's a narrow road, and most people don't find it. See, this 144,000 versus 8 billion, that sounds about few to me. Sounds about the same percentage almost. Millions to 8, 8 billion to 144,000. Sounds very few. The key is, are you going to be one of them? That's the real key. Are you going to be that first fruit? Because if not, this is what you have to look forward to. Verse 6, let's keep reading. 
Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those living on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. See, the eternal gospel. Now, why is it the angels now have to come teach the eternal gospel? What is the eternal gospel? The commandments of God and the faithfulness of Jesus. In other words, baptism for forgiveness of sin. Why do the angels have to teach it? You know why? Because the bride of Christ, the, the 144,000, the first fruit, aren't here to teach it any longer. They're gone. <laughs> They're in the kingdom of God. We just read that in, Reve in Revelation 14, verse 1 through 5. See, we're not here. So the angels have to come teach. So you want to be taught by us right now while you're hearing the message today versus wait and say, oh, that's not true. That's hogwash. My pastors know what they're talking about. I'll go listen to them and believe what you want to believe. You might want to listen to the message today because the Bible says here, look what it says. Fear God. He said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Remember, God just said, that he's not going to allow you to go through the hour of trial if you're the 144,000, but now it says the hour of trial has to. So what do you want to do? Do you want to go through the hour of trial or do you want to not be part of the hour of trial? It's your choice. And it's going to take your humility. Your humility is the key. See, if we're humble to the word of God and we're humble to man that are teaching to you, then you will learn the message. You will be humble to the scriptures. Look what it says. It says, Worship him who made the heavens and earth and the sea and the springs of water. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink of the madness of her adulteries. Well, it says her adulteries. Well, who is her? Her, her are the Vatican and they, all the false churches. See, because the bride of Christ is a church, and that's a her. The false churches are, to, are, are a her. So it's very important to understand what it's talking about. The third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on their forehead or on their hands, they too will drink of God's fury, which has been poured out in full strength in the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day. In other words, no Sabbath day. For those who worship the beast and his image, or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. Now, this is so important to understand. See, right now, there's a chip that's being implemented all around the world. They're trying to get a chip. You know what they're really trying to do? Put a vaccine in your system. You know why? Because AI, the technology, the same Canaanites, the people that call themselves Jews, the people that run this world, right now have created technology. And it's nanotechnology. And they put it in the vaccines. And that's why Bill Gates said all mankind has to be vaccinated before it can go back to normal. So they want you to take a vaccine. You know why? Because that vaccine is going to go into your bloodstream and it's going to change your DNA. You will have a different DNA. You will be demonic. You will have a demonic bloodstream now and you will not be the Lord's anymore. That's why it says anyone who takes that mark of the beast on their right hand or on their forehead will suffer God's wrath. But let's look at what it says. Verse 12, this calls for patient endurance for the part of God's people, those who keep God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. If you notice, it's both. So what's going to happen is this. The angels are going to come back down. Once the bride of Christ are going to go to heaven and all the children are going to be gone. The angels are going to come back down for all the people that are left behind that didn't listen now. They're going to come and teach them. And prayerfully, they'll listen to that. And then you'll have to die for your faith because either you're going to take the mark of the beast or the people on earth are going to kill you for your faith. Because let's look what it says. It says, then the verse said from heaven, write this, blessed are the, dead, are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. See, the people that have died up to that point are already in heaven. They're already gone. But from that point on, those who die from this point on, it says they are blessed. So you have a choice. You can either choose to be first fruit, honor the Lord in his feast days, be ready when it's coming, right now, or you can choose to suffer this fate. It says, yes, the Spirit says, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. You notice he separated two groups out. One group of people that are going to honor him first and be the first fruit. And then those who are alive and come to him when he comes. Those are two different groups of people. Most people teach that group. You know why? Because they can't see the first fruit. Because the first fruit are secrets to the kingdom of heaven. It's not for everyone. It's for those who are alive and are waiting for him, 
who are awake, who are excited, who can't wait to meet, meet the kingdom of God and be in the kingdom of God. Let's read two more scriptures on where that's going to be. John 14. This is so exciting, so encouraging, and so inspiring. It says here, Do not let your hearts be troubled. This is John 14, verse 1. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. See, you disciples, you of Saved by Truth Ministry, you brothers and sisters that are listening to this message, you now know the way. You now know exactly what you need to do to make it to the kingdom of God. You now know the way to the place you are going. Because he has made a place for you. He's waiting for you. He's, he's pulling for you. He's pleading with you. He's begging you. He's atoned for you. He said, even though you've been sinning all this time, even though you've disregarded my Sabbath days, even though you have broken the commandments all this time, you know, you're my last sheep. You're the one sheep that come back and you're honoring it today. Please, in your heart, repent. Because I've prepared a place for you. Are you willing to do it? If you're watching this message on Facebook around this world, are you willing to repent from your sins and start honoring him by the heart? From this point, and never break another Sabbath day. Whether if you are the first fruit or if you're not, make a decision in your heart and demands. I'll never break God's feast days again. I'll never honor a false uh, Christmas and Easter and, and all the pagan holidays that the Vatican invented. I'll never do that. It, by the heart, by faith. Faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not see. By faith. Are you willing to do that? Because if you do, this is what you get to enjoy. First Thessalonians 4. First Thessalonians 4, starting in verse 13. It says, brothers and sisters, so he's talking to you. I want you to look at this message. He's talking directly to you. It says, brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be informed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. It says, we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive and are left until the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Yeah. My wife wants me to blow the trumpet. And that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to do my best to blow this trumpet today um, for the Lord, and we'll end our service. And that's what we're looking to hear. The trumpet to sound, so we can go meet the Lord in the air. And I pray all of you have a great and fabulous Feast of Tabernacle. Let's end it off in prayer. Father God, I just want to thank you so much for this day, God. Thank you so much for this message. I pray for all the brothers and sisters that are listening to the message, that they take heed to the message, that they uh, honor this week and, and take this week to spend with you, Father. I pray that they pray for themselves and their family, for the mistakes that they made, for the errors of, of disobedience, God. Just like the Israelites disobeyed, uh, disobey, Father, I pray that anybody that's this has been missing the Sabbath day and been missing the, the Holy Days, God. I pray they repent, per, repent from this point on. Father, make it a, a decision in their heart that they're going to honor you. And Father, I pray that you're coming. I pray on a great star, on a great cloud, that you're coming um, immediately, Father. I pray that in the middle of that week that you do come and you do uh, take us to be on the top of that rock, Father. Just like the, the, land, the ship landed on the top of that rock, Father, I pray that we can land on the top of the rock and be with you so we can be at your feet 
and worship you with all the rest of the brothers who have died in Christ up to this point, Father. We just thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for these feasts, these feasts. I believe that this feast is going to be the most glorious feast of all. And we thank you so much for this time. We love you. We adore you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.